Hello there, my name's Patrick Denny and welcome to this video presentation about life in Edwardian Colchester. Now, before we begin, just a few words perhaps about the period that I'm going to be discussing. Now, the, the official period that we know as the Edwardian years, of course, ran from January 1901 to when Queen Victoria died to the death of her son Edward VII in 1910. But for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to be including the full period from around 1900 up to about 1914. Now, over the years, when I've, I've given this talk in the past, or one very similar to it, I remember in the early days, I used to often ask the audience um, at the beginning of the talk if they wouldn't mind raising their hand if they were born before 1914. And, you know, quite often, many in the audience would raise their hand. And, uh, you know, these were people who were born perhaps in the late Victorian period, right up to the sort of First World War um, period in 1914. You know, I, I still ask that same question of today's audiences, but of course, no one raises their hands today. Now, in this presentation, although none of those Edwardians, if you like, from the earlier times are still with us, um, I will nevertheless be trying to share with you some of their stories and memories, perhaps, um, that they shared with me about what life was like for them in Colchester at this time. So without any further ado, let's make a start on the presentation. And my, my first image, um, this, um, you'll probably recognise this, but this is Headgate, Headgate Corner, looking up Head Street towards the High Street. And um, the date is the 26th of January, 1901. There's a large crowd of people and if you look in the centre here, there's the Mayor of Colchester at the time. That's Claude Edgerton Green. Um, all the councillors are there. There's mounted policemen. There's a, a large group of onlookers. And what he's doing is, this is about 12 p.m. It's, it's a Saturday, 26th of January, and he's proclaiming the accession to the throne of Edward, Edward who became Edward VII. And they were doing this throughout the country, all towns and cities throughout the kingdom, similar messages were being relayed about this time and one of the reasons why they did it here of all places um headgate headgate corner is the site was the site of the old roman gate or one of the gates going into the roman town and this was traditionally one of the points in the town where special proclamations would be made going going back in in the past but in Colchester, they didn't just do it once. They actually repeated this message at different sites four times. So once this message had been um, spoken, imagine this vast crowd turning around, walking up Head Street, turning right into High Street, and they were going to the next important site, another traditional site for giving proclamations and important messages, and that was the site of the town's East Gate, the East Roman Gate. So let's go down to there, or... Well, we haven't quite got there because this is the site of the second proclamation and there's the mayor again claude edgerton green you can see the town sergeant and all the people around but he hasn't got to the east gate the the east gate is just below st james church as you come up east hill so they've stopped about 200 yards short and they're standing on the the actual step the doorstep of east hill house why have they done that did they get tired <laughs> Did they make a mistake? Well, the answer is because East Hill House was the mayor's residence. This was his home. He wasn't going to miss this opportunity. Imagine you had the opportunity of making this important announcement right on your own doorstep. And you can see people in the upper floors look and hear um, from me within the house having a look down. So that was proclamation number two. They then turned around and went back up to the high street roughly to where the red line is for proclamation number three. I often think that's fun. I think, well, why didn't they do that on the way down? But anyway, they went back to this site here. Here they are again. And this is traditionally known as the site of the old obelisk. Because where they're standing here, there used to be a very large stone obelisk, which really took the form of a glorified milestone, really. And it had on there so many miles to London, so many miles to Ipswich and Harwich, and so forth but anyway there they are this is a, a much clearer picture you can clearly see the mayor here all the councillors you know if you could study this photograph you know people like james paxman john kent wilson marriage 
you be able to identify them. Policemen again in the front here. In the background, we, we've got these, um, which look a bit like old Wild West wagons, but they're carrier carts. These would have come into Colchester, um, certainly on a Saturday, but also during the week, from all the country villages all around, um, doing shopping for people, picking up, collecting orders, and so on and so forth. And also in the background, um, this is interesting, if you look on that sign here, this building, it says the Lamb Inn. Now, in 1903, that, that building, all this lot was pulled down. And in the following year, they built a new, two new buildings there. And one of them was a, um, a grand theatre, which later was renamed the Hippodrome on this site here. That was a music hall. Um, and they did twice nightly performances. And people that I've spoken to said that they used to see people like Mari Lloyd, Vesta Tilly, Harry Champion. Uh, and we know that Charlie Chapman, the famous comedian, before he went to America, he also performed at the Hippodrome. But what they also did was build a new building next door, a new Lamb Inn. And um, that building's still there. It's not called the Lamb Inn now. I think it's called After Office Hours. But if you stand outside the building with the Hippodrome and the, and the, and the pub next door, if you like, if you look up high, you can still see a little lamb, a model of a lamb, sitting on a little ledge after the building was originally called the Lamb Inn. And once they'd finished this proclamation, they still hadn't quite finished. They then went up to the top of the high street for the final reading. And I'm just showing you here, um, just in case you wonder what the obelisk looked like. Well, there it is in the past. This is an old print here, um, actually showing the pieman selling pies. This little boy here, supposed to be from the Blue Coat School, apparently if he could correctly guess two out of three tosses of a coin, the pieman used to give him a pie. But look, you can see on here, um, you can see here so many miles to Norwich and Colchester and so on. The, this obelisk was actually removed from the high street in 1958. It was auctioned off on site. So you imagine the auctioneer standing in the middle of the high street, got a crowd around him, and he finally knocks it down for three pound five shillings. And it was purchased by a man called Charles Wire. And later, he had this transferred to the cemetery, which you can see on the picture on the right hand side. And the stones where traditionally it had so many miles to here, there and everywhere. Apparently these were probably reversed. So they're now on the inside and on the outside, they then carved um, memorial messages, messages regarding their family. And if you look closely right at it, it says ancient obelisk removed from the high street. And this was dedicated to Mary Ann Wire and later Charles Wire. That became their memorial tomb. If you go to the cemetery today and you, you find yourself in the car park near the crematorium, and if you drive out, you'll go within about six feet of this on your right hand side. Um, OK, so this is Colchester High Street, circa 1903. The town hall, which you can see on the right, was fairly new. It opened in May 1902, and the entire building of the town hall, including all the full-size marble statues and all the stained glass windows and the marble stairs and everything else, the clock tower, um, cost about £55,000 in those days. Um, so it's uh, compared with today, of course, you wouldn't even buy a, probably a small flat for that price. But just looking at the high street, there's the, there's the Red Lion Hotel on, on the left here, but the street is, it looks very muddy, doesn't it? So there was no tarmac as such on the streets. It was sort of gravel and mud and dirt. And um, in the winter months, of course, this would have been very squelchy and muddy. And you know, the, the Victorian or the Edwardian ladies used to wear these long skirts, didn't they, that literally swept the, the street as they walked along. So they could have got quite messy and muddy. And what they often had, they, they used to have little crossing places at various points that could be swept clean so people could cross there. I, I've, I've, I've also been told by some people that these long skirts that these Edwardian ladies used to wear, in some cases they could remove the bottom, say 12 inches, they could unbutton it, so that that could easily be washed and kept clean without having to wash the whole skirt. And of, of course in the summer the streets were very dusty. Um, and what would happen, you'd have all the dust, the, the wind would be blowing, and don't forget you've got horse droppings all dried up, and that would blow all over the buildings. 
you know and used to have butcher shops lining the street with all their wares all their meat and everything hanging up one wonders how contaminated that that might have become but the picture we're looking at now there's no the trams haven't even arrived yet um, it's mostly horse drawn there would have been one or two motor cars this this is the picture on the left i'm showing you of the first motor car in colchester coming up east hill in about 1896 but there would have only been a handful it's mainly all horse drawn transport at that time and this is the typical um, of one of those horse um, carriages if you like there, there, there was no public transport as such so when the trams came along you had public transport but even with the carriers carts that used to come in and out of colchester all the time from the surrounding villages although they took passengers it, it wasn't a, a public transport system you, you might end up sitting on a, a, a bag of potatoes or some old wooden bench or something but you could travel you could pay for that but what we're looking at is a horse-drawn hackney carriage now these these were public transport if you like and at the time that we're looking at this, this is about circa 1905 but about 1903 1904 was the high point of horse-drawn transport not just in colchester but in in the country there was something like three and a half to four million horses working on the roads um, around england and um in colchester we had about 120 of these horse carriages are licensed as hackney carriages and they were all different sorts and sizes there was four wheeled ones like this broom which you can see which was the most popular of all the carriages there was landos victoria coaches omnibuses handsome cabs i said about 120 probably at all and that again was the high point of horse transport in colchester because what was happening very slowly you were getting lots of motor cars coming along so that was eating away at the, the horse transport and then when the first world war came along of course a lot of the horses went and by the end of the war 1920s very few um, horse carriages left in comparison there would have been a few of the you know horse drawn coal lorries and vegetable lorries and trucks that would have gone around maybe maybe up to the next war but basically um, it was becoming much more motorized motorized and, and this um, carriage we're looking at the brougham as I said they were known as four wheelers it, it was really popular probably 60% of all the horse cabs in Colchester were these. So it's a small little carriage and um, and it was drawn, it, it was and driven by a driver here, usually with just the one horse. The door was on the side. So you opened up the door and there's a little step here. You put your foot on that and pulled yourself in. And they had two seats facing forwards for, for two adults. And there was another small seat behind the driver facing backwards where you could probably have got a couple of children or maybe another adult and all of these hackney carriages um drivers they had to adhere to a whole set of rules and regulations as you, as you might expect and the taxi drivers probably do today they were called hackney carriage bylaws and um it stipulated things they couldn't and couldn't do for one thing the, the cabbies were not allowed to smoke unless they had got permission from their fare the maximum speed limit was six miles an hour you know and i often think well how would they know how fast they were going and they didn't have speedometers or anything like that um and if you was really in a hurry you could probably run faster than than six miles an hour interestingly as, as an aid to this it wasn't until about 1908 that the policemen in colchester were issued with stopwatches um so that they could time cars to see if they were speeding or not so they would you know clock them at say the bottom of north hill and again at the top and and then work out whether they were speeding because the speed limit at that time had probably gone up to about 12 miles an hour that was the that was the limit another bylaw was that they were not allowed to take a journey for more than five miles so that of course effectively condemned them to the borough boundary in other words you couldn't get a cab um, to Mersey or, or to Brightlingsea you'd have to find some other way getting there or, or maybe get a ride on a carrier car and they were quite expensive it would cost anything between sixpence and a shilling a mile 
So if you wanted to go from the high street down to North Station, it could cost you up to a shilling, which would have been way beyond the, you know, the capabilities of everyday people. So it would have been like high days and holidays, perhaps, that you could afford to have a ride in a, in a handsome cab or one of these four wheeled cabs. But of course, there were um, business people and, and what have you who use them all the time. Um, in London, they I'm, I'm just showing you a picture of horse traffic in London. And you can see in the foreground here, there's a four wheeler. Now in London, they, they didn't actually use a, their four wheelers weren't based on a brougham carriage. They were slightly bigger. They were called a Clarence. But in London and, and some of the other big cities, they were always known as growlers. Um, and the reason being, they, they had these iron rimmed wheels, same as the ones in Colchester, iron rimmed wheels. And when these carriages used to rattle over the cobblestones and what have you, they made a real noise, hence they called them growlers. Now, I've also been told that even in Colchester, if, if somebody was ill in bed, someone's not very well and they're in bed, you could go along to the council and uh, they would come out and they would lay straw on the road outside your house so that when these carts and wagons came by they didn't upset the the person who was in bed ill can you imagine them doing that today and and another thing i've been told is that when if somebody died typically if someone died then several of the neighbors either side and across the street would all put black ups out it was just what they did it was just a, a mark of respect and things like this of course have, have, have sort of vanished now but um, going back to our horse-drawn carriages, the second most popular carriage in Colchester was the Hansom, the Hansom cab. Um, and they were known as two-wheelers, as you can see, and they were licensed for two people. Now, I know you've got three young men sitting in this one who probably got in trouble if it had been found, but they were licensed for two people. This is um, at the Crown Inn at Lexton and possibly they're off on a night in Colchester to the Hippodrome or something like this. The, the driver, instead of being here um, on a hansom, he sits right at the back and he's got a little box. There's a little trap door here which he can open up and speak to his passengers. Um, they had more refinements. For, for one thing, they had solid rubber tyres rather than the iron rim ones. So you, you got the impression, I think, of a sort of speedy and nippier journey. But, you know, these were really for the young and the adventurous, if you like. It, it seems that many of the older people or the middle aged people didn't really go for handsome cabs. It may have been that they felt a bit unnervy being right behind the horse, um, you know, and the driver nowhere to be seen. Because if you remember in the brooms or the four wheelers, they're confined in this little box, the driver's between them and the horse, and they probably felt a bit more comfortable. But, um, but I, as I said, these were the second most popular carriage in Colchester. And just uh, one other one to show you before we move on. This is a horse drawn omnibus. Now, this is outside the Red Lion Hotel. Now, the omnibuses were the forerunners of, of the buses and the modern coaches that take you on your luxury holidays. They all started off horse drawn, um, similar to this one. Now, we're just looking at the back view. But if you look underneath, you can see there's two horses. So they're slightly larger vehicles. The door would have been at the back. The door was always at the back with these. And they would put a little step ladder down and people would go in and like sit round on benches around the outside facing the, the, the middle, if you like. And these would probably hold no more than about 10 um, passengers at one time. And you can see on top, just about see the luggage rack that was over there. Now in Colchester, we had about three or four of these every year, and they were mainly owned by the hoteliers. So the, the Red Lion had one, the George had one, and the Cups Hotel had one. And basically their, yeah, their main reason for being there was to go down to North Station and to meet all the trains coming in. And then I suppose they would give maybe even free rides back up if they um, stayed at their hotel perhaps. Um, in London, of course, they, they had omnibuses, but they were much larger. They were longer and they had double deckers on them. So, you know, with a little staircase going up. So in London, the big ones in the cities would probably have about 30 you could carry. But these ones, as I said, between eight and 10, and they were known, these were actually known as station omnibuses throughout the country. 
because they, they did the station trade. That was basically what, what they did. And here we're looking at a, a lovely example of one of these um, station omnibuses, small omnibuses. And this was Norfolk's omnibus at Nayland, circa 1912. Now, many of you will have heard of Norfolk's buses. You know, they ran a fleet of buses around, I, I think, about 1950s, they might have been taken over by Eastern National, but they, again, they all started horse and carts. Many of these um, carriages and omnibus proprietors converted to motor vehicles during the First World War. So they would keep the carriage, but they would put it on a, sash, um, a chassis of a Ford T or something like that. But many of them did continue a bit longer. And this picture we're looking at now was taken in Nayland, and it may well be they're on the way into Colchester. So we can see the driver here. There's two passengers presumably sitting up with the driver. You see all the luggage on top. And then you can just about see some of the passengers sitting inside. And I've got another picture which I'm, I'm going to show you of Norfolk's buses, which is one of my favourite views. And here we've got Norfolk's omnibus. That I believe is Mr Norfolk himself. These might be his grandchildren. They've got their caps on them, money bags over their shoulders. We can see the luggage on top and inside that's probably going to be packed with passengers. And um, what's happening here, they've, they've come down from Great Hawksley towards Colchester. They're coming down um, and they've come down into Nayland and the, the rivers obviously flood its banks and the whole area is flooded. And as this is, we know this was in April 1919. So he hasn't got rid of his um, horse-drawn vehicle during the war. And of course the horse, um, it doesn't worry the horse, he can just plod along through the water. But interestingly, at the same time, another photograph was taken at the same floods of one of his competitors um, who had a motor cab. And this is the one we're looking at. And it says here, look, marooned in the floods at Nayland, um, the Boxford bus in difficulties. Um, and this was the same flood. So as soon as they tried to take the motor bus through, obviously, obviously everything conked out. So once more, look, we've gone from this. Now, this was 1919. We've only just over 100 years. It's just over a century. But we've gone from that to something like this, haven't we? Um, and it just shows you how things are progressing in a relatively short period of time. Now, the horse cabs... Um, there were various ranks in the town where they were allowed to park up and, and get their trade. They were not allowed to apply for trade um, in any old where. But um, the four ranks, the, the largest of the ranks was here. Um, uh, this is at the, the top of West Stockwell Street, really, just about here. That was the largest rank, and that would have had space for 20 carriages. There was a slightly smaller one up the road here outside the fire office where you could have eight carriages. And then there was one outside St Buttles Railway Station, which we now call Colchester Town. That was for two. And finally, in Crouch Street, somewhere near where the old um, Odeon or the, the Regal Cinema used to be, um, there was space for five cabs there. And, you know, another one of these interesting bylaws was this. It didn't matter in those days which side of the road you parked or which way you was facing. But if... Imagine this horse carriage here. If he was the first one to arrive and he swung his cab round and twisted it round and parked it with his horse facing down towards East Hill, then everybody else had to do the same. The law was you were not allowed to put two horses' heads together. as a Hackney carriage by law. You know, even today, if you've been to places like Great Yarmouth or, or Blackpool, where they still have horse-drawn carriages riding up and down the seafront, you'll never see two horses heads together. They're always parked, you know, facing in the same direction. This is further up the high street. This is showing you the cabs outside the fire office. So there's the fire office over here, look. Um, see the sign here for Lay and Wheeler. They were there for many, many years, weren't they? Um, the wine and spirit merchants. But look over here, look, see the cabs all lined up outside the fire office. But notice they're, they're actually on the wrong, they're facing the wrong way really for the side of the road that, that they're on, but it didn't really matter too much in those days. And what I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna go over to the top here and we're gonna look backwards down the high street. So here we go, we see the carriages. 
Now this one, because the driver's sitting high up, that, that's a handsome cab. But you know, like many of these old photographs, if you look carefully, you can date them because there's things going on that even the original photographer probably wasn't aware of. First of all, we know it must be before the town hall opened because there's no town hall tower. So we know it must be before 1902, but we can see the scaffolding. So that's the scaffolding for the building of the town hall. So hold fire on that for a moment. And then over here, on that building there, now that building, this building is the current McDonald's restaurant building in the high street. But in that period, it was owned by a man called Loom. Looms, it was Harry Loom's drapery shop. And we know from other records that Harry Loom didn't move into this building until midway through 1901. So it can't be earlier because his name wouldn't be there. Someone else's name was there. So we can almost date this picture to after the summer of 1901, probably late summer, early autumn, 1901, when they're getting on with the building of the town hall. And in this lovely view I'm showing you, um, we can see the town hall with nearly completed, with the scaffolding all the way up. And it's interesting about this scaffolding, I don't know if, um, if any ex-scaffolders or scaffolders are, are listening to this, but of course there was no nuts and bolts or metal poles, it, it was all timber poles of varying diameters, all held together by rope, all expertly knotted together. And I don't know whether you've noticed there's a, a single man on horseback, look, riding down the high street. Behind him, these are the, what formerly were underground laboratories. They were, they were not filled in until about 1950, late 1950s. But um, yeah, it, it, it was not unusual for people to ride around on, on horseback. I remember speaking to one lady who attended the girls' high school around the First World War time and she told me that several of her school friends used to come to school on horseback. She said there was, there was one girl who lived at Fingrenhoe, always came in on a horse and she said she used to stable the horse in the stables behind the Fleece Hotel which was in Head Street many of you remember and she said there was another family came in on a governor's cart from, from Boxted or somewhere as well. So nothing unusual. Now I just want to introduce you to one of the people I spoke about many years ago, I'm no longer with us unfortunately, but this is Jack Ashton. Jack was born in 1902. And um, when I interviewed Jack, I, I think the, the total interview went on for about nine or 10 hours. Not altogether, I might add, it was all done in little bites, but he was a fantastic raconteur who could talk and talk and talk about his memories. He spent most of his working life, 50 odd years, working for what was then the, the Great Eastern Railway, um, he started off at the beginning and he eventually became a steam train driver and just moved into the diesel and the electric era as well. I remember Jack telling me that he said you couldn't, no one could get a job as an engine driver from day one. He said you had to, if an opportunity came up, which was quite rare, he said everybody started with a rag in their hand. And he said he remembered cleaning engines. And then you work your way up to become an assistant fireman, fireman, assistant driver, and so on and so forth. And um, it takes a lot of time. But I remember when I was interviewing Jack, um, I, would, I can remember sitting in his lounge. I could put the tape recorder on. I could press go. I could ask him a question. I could then go around town doing my shopping and come back and he'd still be talking. <laughs> a fantastic character. But one of the things Jack told me in relation to these people coming in the towns on horses, and Jack was quite an enterprising young boy at the time, apparently. Um, for example, he told me that on Sunday mornings, he would always be in Holy Trinity Church, pumping the organ to earn a few pennies. He said, after school, I would go around the shops, cadging all the old wooden boxes they had. I would then bring them home into my mother's cellar and I would chop them all up, bundle them up as firewood and take them around the streets to sell them. But he says, on a Saturday morning, you'd find me in the high street. And he used to go in the high street, right at the top of the high street, on the left-hand side, opposite the fire office, where the banks were. The banks are still there, aren't they, most, some of them. And he says, what would happen? Many of these gentlemen from the country would come into town on a Saturday on their horses or with horse carriages. And of course, when they went to go into the bank or somewhere, they needed someone to look after the horse for them. 
And he says, we used to call it holding your horse's head, sir. And he says, I used to earn several coppers on a Saturday morning holding the horse's heads. Now, another one of the carriages that um, we, we had a few of these in Colchester, these are called large brakes. Now, these large brakes were often used for taking people on outings. I'm sure you've seen photographs of them. They were also used for training horses because they, they were quite heavy. That's a good thing. But unlike, um, just to explain the difference between a brake and a charabang, with a charabang, all the seats are facing forwards. But with a brake, as we're looking at now, the seats are down the side. So you have a bench running along the side and the other side, and probably a couple of benches in the middle. So that was the kind of difference between a brake and a charabang. But we've got a lovely picture coming up of a, a large brake outside what used to be farmers in the high street, about 1907, something like that. And um, there's a, I think there's 30 or more people on there. And um, the fact they're all men suggests it could have been a pub outing perhaps or something like that. And look at the, I mean, the horse, it looks like you can see the horse's ribs. And you think, well, how would those poor horses have pulled this cart around up and down hills, for example? I mean, the cart itself would probably have weighed a ton. So, um, and quite often, I, I, I always used to think there was two horses there until I was doing this talk once and someone said, excuse me, Mr. Denny, but how many legs does a horse got? Because there's more than eight legs there. And of course, there's another, you can just about see another horse's head on the far side. So there's three horses here. But even so, it would have been a bit of a problem for the, for the poor old horses to do that. And um, I thank our friend Jack Ashton again. This is Jack again, who we met a, a few moments ago. Now, Jack was telling me um, that his father used to be a horse cabbie in town. And his father used to drive the brakes, the handsome cabs, the four wheelers and, and all the rest of it. And he says that he would often take these parties out, these groups out. And he says, if ever they were going on a Saturday, he would often say to me, Jack, do you want to come? And he says, I used to jump at the chance. And he said, I used to sit on the little brake boy's seat, which stuck out at the back here. You can see a boy sitting there now. And he says, if we were going down steep hills, for example, that could be a problem. Because the sheer weight of this cart and all these people could push down, almost push the horses over. So he says, when we're going down a hill, dad would shout out, brakes, Jack. And when he shouted at brakes, I knew what I had to do. And attached to a little chain or a little rope at the back, I had a little a block that I would dangle down and jam underneath one of the wheels to stop the wheel turning. Um, much like this, I'm putting a little illustration as you can see what happened. And he said, father sitting up at the front would have a big handbrake, but that wasn't enough. So what I had to do is jam one of the wheels so it wouldn't turn. You only need to do it to one wheel and then it would stop. And then what would the wheel, the carriage would stop and then the horses could kind of just sort of pull it down, if you like, at their own speed. And Jack said one of the favourite places that we used to, my father used to take people in those days on outings was to Newton Green on the way to Sudbury. And he said, of course, they didn't go for the golf in those days. because you, you'll, you'll be aware there's a big golf course there now. But he said they went for the booze up. There's a big pub on the corner by the road there. So all these people would go out there. When they arrived, they'd be drinking all day. And late afternoon, father would say, right, come on, everybody back on the car. And they would make their way home to Colchester. But he says, when they came just through Nayland and they wanted to go up that, he says, a really long hill going up to Great Hawkesbury. I think he said it was called Sandy Hill. And um, cause I, I mean, that was another one of my questions. How on earth would these horses pull that up there? Well, Jack gave me the answer. He said, when my dad got to the bottom of the hill, he would stop the cart and he would shout, right, everyone off. And everyone was expected to walk up the hill. Although Jack did say there might have been a couple who were a bit too inebriated who couldn't. But that was the thing. And people generally remember seeing people walking up hills. You know, I was, I was told by somebody fairly recently um, that he remembers in the 1960s with motor buses at Molden, now you know when you go into Molden, there's a very, very steep hill, it's called Market Hill. And he was telling me that he can remember in the 60s, 
the driver stopping the bus and everyone had to get off get off the bus and walk up market hill at Malden. so yeah with steep hills can be a bit of a problem um but anyway finally in 1904 july 1904 the town finally had an electric tramway now this was this was brilliant this was cheap transport for the masses rather than paying something like between sixpence and a shilling a mile for a horse cab all the fares now are about a penny a go um you know um cheap fares for workers in the early morning half price fares for children and um they were all open top double deckers um initially there were 16 cars and then they added two more a couple of years later and here we can see the the opening day the opening ceremony if you like on the 28th of july 1904 it was a terrible day look at all the umbrellas it was pouring down with rain but that didn't stop about 10,000 people in colchester having a tram ride that very first day and when you consider the population of colchester was probably no more than about 45,000 at the time you know that's not far short of a quarter of everyone in the town going on the trams now the trams ran from the high street obviously they went down to east gates but they stopped at east gates if you, if you wanted to go further obviously you'd have to walk the rest of the way but they went to east gates they went down to the hive um, they also went to lexton and then all of them went to north station now i said two years later they opened up another run to the recreation ground at old heath so We've got East Gates, the Hive, the Recreation Ground, and Lexton, and they all came via the High Street and they would make their way to North Station. And all the way along these routes, every 15 minutes, every tram would arrive like clockwork at its stop. But on the, on the route between the High Street and North Station, you'd see a tram coming up and down that hill every five minutes of the day, because that's where all the trams were heading for in the end but anyway the first tram we the the guests if you like were the mayor and mayoress this is ernest barrett he was the mayor gertrude barrett was the mayoress and they took the controls of tram car number 13 um and it made its maiden verney made maiden journey to lexton to the lexton terminus and this road coming on that would be lexington straight road going going along there so that's as far as the the tram went but you can see clearly the mayor and mayoress apparently gertrude she wore a very long pink flowing chiffon dress that apparently got very wet and muddy and um, with the comings and goings but that you know she was thrilled this was um a lovely opportunity to do something and take prominent stage if you like at this big event we can see here the the conductor or the driver is pulling the big overhead arm which trailed behind the tram to pick up electricity so that would have come here he's turning it round so when they drive the tram back to town the, it will be trailing behind them and of course they didn't turn the trams round you could drive them from this end or you can drive them from that end and here we've got a lovely shot this is um, a picture of a tram down at the hive terminus down the bottom of hive hill um, the fact you've got a female conductress there suggests this was probably taken during the First World War when many of the men employees were out and serving away. There you can see the driver. Notice they never had any windscreens or anything like this. They were completely open to the elements and sometimes apparently they were like covered in snow. And they, as I said, they were open top double deckers, but the top wasn't, it was un, open top here. So you can see here all the seats the the wooden slatted seats and the, the back of the seats could swing left or right depending on which way the tram was actually driving so the passengers could always be facing from the front some of the i mean i've heard stories that um some of the youngsters around town used to get up to mischief one of the worst things i think i've been told they did was you know in november time they'd be throwing lighted fireworks on top of the open top buses and uh, trams um, you know, much to the annoyance of the, of the passengers. And then uh, finally, tram picture. This is a, a tram coming up North Hill. Now, North Hill was a problem, and, and also East Hill and High Hill to some extent, because the, the each of these trams weighed 10 tonnes. 
But because they had to negotiate North Hill in particular, each of the trams in Colchester had to be fitted with two 35 horsepower motors. Whereas normally on a Flatmore country, you get away with one, one of those motors. But to cope with the hills, they were each fitted with two of these 35 horsepower motors. But it wasn't just a problem coming up. It was also could be a problem going down these steep hills. I'm going to introduce you now to another one of my um, people that I interviewed many years ago. And this is Harry Salmon. Now, Harry Salmon, he, he's in his police uniform. He became Inspector Harry Salmon of Colchester Borough Police. And when I interviewed Harry, um, he was 95 years old. He was born in 1895 and he was 95 when I recorded his memories. And he was living at Ipswich at the time. And he started off giving me a little bit of background, which is quite interesting. Um, he was born at West Burgholt and uh, he left school when he was 12. And you were allowed to do that in those days, providing you had progressed as far as standard five and you had passed your labour certificate, which the, the children in Colchester used to take at North Street School. And then you could leave school. So he left school when he was 12 and he said, my first job was as a milk boy on a local farm. And he got about three and six a week, he told me. But he said, I got a bit fed up of that. And um, he said, one day to me, my mum said to me, Harry boy, why don't you go and get a job on the trams? So we thought, OK. So he said, I went down to the tram office, which was in Magdalen Street. And it's, it's, it's only just been really um, demolished, really. And he said, I had an interview and I got a job as a conductor of the trams. Now, don't forget, this is all before the First World War. And he says they were very strict, he says. If, if you're driving your tram along and um, you pull away from a stop and there's someone ru running to get the tram and they're a bit late and you don't wait for them, he says that would almost be a second offence. He said, very strict and we, we cared about doing things the right way. But he says, as, as time get, got, went on, he says, I was a big strapping young lad. And they said to me, would you like to train to become a driver or a motorman, they called it. And he said, yeah, I, I, I jumped at the chance. And he says, um, and Harry could remember virtually everything he had to do to become a, a tram driver. One of the things was, he says, you had to spend some time working in the garage with the mechanics, you know, underneath the tram, get to know what the tram were like and how they ran it, et cetera, and so forth. And um, he said, you had to spend some time going out on a, a tram with a driver, getting to know the routes of where everything was going. And then he said, finally, you had an oral examination with the manager. And I thought this was quite strange because he said, you didn't actually have a driving test. Yeah, they didn't say, let's see if you can do it on your own, Harry. But anyway, he went on to explain this oral examination. And he, at 95 years of age, which you'll see depicted here, he could remember virtually all the questions he was asked. And he says, the last question, he said, they tried to ask me a trick question. And it went something like this. He said, the manager said to me, we're sitting across a desk. He says, Salmon, you're going along in your tram, Lexton Road, two and a half miles an hour. And a little child runs in front of you. What do you do? And he says, I shot back, slam the car and reverse, sir. Put on the magnetic brake. That will stop the tram. He said, he flew back at me. He says, haven't you been told never to use your magnetic brake in such circumstances? And he says, being a young lad, I wasn't going to stop. He says, I went back to him. I said, ah, but you said we was only going at two and a half miles an hour. And at that speed, the brakes wouldn't work anyway. He said, stop. Don't think you know everything. Get out of my office. <laughs> and he says, but I got the job. And he became a tram driver. And he said to me, the hardest part of our job was going down North Hill or some of the other steep hills first thing in the morning, first tram down. He said, he says, if it was one of these greasy mornings, as he described it, you know, where the, the rails are still wet. And he says, you know, remember, these are massive 10 ton machines. And he says, you're going down the tram and you you always have to go down the hills with your handbrake on and off to keep it. And he says, if you. When you put your magnetic brake on, on these wet rails, on a greasy morning, the whole tram starts skidding. It won't get a grip and it's building up speed, slipping down the hill. And he says, if you don't do something and stop it before the tram gets to the bottom of the hill, 
it's going to come off the rails. No question. And he says that means that mechanics and everything from the garage, you've got to spend all day probably jacking that up and getting it back. He said, you know what we used to do? He said, underneath where we stood in our cabs, we had a large box and it was full of sand. And on, be, near our feet in the cab was a little pedal. And when we're going down the hill in these circumstances, we used to pump that pedal all the time, pumping it. And as we pumped it, little bits of sand would be shoot, was shooting onto the track to help get a grip, to get some traction. And he says, on many a morning, I've been going down North Hill or Hive Hill on a greasy morning, he says, pumping sand like the Dickens all the way down to slow the tram down. Now, this is another lovely picture of a tram. This, um, you could hire the trams for special occasions. And this tram you're looking at now in, was hired by Alfred Bunting. Now, Alfred Bunting was the proprietor of North Nurseries, which um, many will remember the Bunting family. It went right the way from what is now Serpentine Walk, right through under the railway bridge. And of course, when they built the bypass in the Albert Hotel, they had to buy land off the Buntings. But anyway, in 1905, Mr. Bunting's daughter, Mildred, was getting married at Lime Walk Church. And um, so they hired this tram and they apparently hired the tram to collect guests who were arriving at North Station. And then the tram would come up to the high street, stop outside the Red Lion, and then they could all get off, walk through the Lion Yard, down Lion Walk to Lion Walk Church. Incidentally, um, the bridal party, they all came up from North Station Road, where the Bunting family used to live. They had a big house on North Station Road. They all came up in horse-drawn carriages. And everything that I'm telling you now was told me by somebody who attended that wedding in 1905. Well, apparently when they all got to the red line, as you can see here, they all got off the tram and all they had to do now was walk through the red line yard to get to the church. But apparently the landlord stood in the way, put his arms out and said, stop, you're not coming through here. And they started arguing, we've got a wedding. No, you're not coming through. And as much as they complained, he wouldn't let them go through. And the reason being, he said, you buntings are temperance people, aren't you? You're always preaching against the evils of drink. And now you want to come through my pub. He made his point. And, but apparently one of the, the elderly aunts of the bunting family was there. And um, she went and had words with him. She apologized, et cetera, et cetera. And he let them through. So they went and got to the wedding okay at Lime Walk. Um, I, it made me remember, and some of you might remember this, but I can remember back in the 1960s being in the high street on more than one occasion and wanting to go through to Culver Street and thought I'd take a little shortcut through the Red Line Yard. Um, because when we got to the far end, there was gates and there, the door was shut, locked. I don't think anyone remembers that. So you had to come all the way back and then make your way around, go through Pelham's Lane or something like that, because it was private property. It probably still is, but nowadays you can make a, a free journey through there. But anyway, we've got a lovely picture of that wedding. And it's almost like a mini society wedding. This picture was taken in the garden of the, of the house they had in um, what was then called Snake Lane, but now it's called Serpentine Walk. And... Um, and here we've got Mildred, she's the, the, the bride. This is Winnie Bunting, Winifred Bunting. And that's the lady or the girl who told me this story. I met Winifred when she was about 92 or three years old. Come back to that later. This is Guy Barrett. He's the page boy. Remember the Mayor Barrett and his wife in the tram picture? That is their son. Interestingly, when you look at this picture, one of the only people not smiling towards the camera is the groom, Harry Ingle. But um, I, I often sort of muse and think, well, who's he looking at? And you, you wonder where he's, he's got eyes for somebody else. But anyway, they got married. Everything went well. And everybody thought that they're now the, the married couple are now going down to Eastbourne or somewhere for their honeymoon. But what actually happened is that her parents squirreled her back home and almost kept her locked in a bedroom for about a week after the wedding. You might think, well, why? What happened? Well, because next week they got married again. 
This wedding at Lionwalk Church was a nonconformist wedding, if you like, and the Ingalls were staunch Anglicans. And although they went through with this wedding, this congregational wedding, if congregations wedding, if you like, next week they did it again at All Saints Church in the High Street. And we've got two wedding certificates just to prove it. Um, this one at the top, 1905, this is the 12th of June look, Harry Ingle, Mildred Bunting, Lion Walk. And one week later, the 19th of June, 1905, Harry Ingle, Mildred Bunting, All Saints Church in the High Street. It's interesting that, isn't it? If, if, if you're doing family history and you come across two weddings, apparently for the same people, just a few weeks apart maybe, it may be something similar. Maybe there was um, religious differences perhaps in the family and both wanted to do it their own way. So this was the compromise. Now this is uh, Winnie, when I met her, look, there's Winnie, she's in her 90s there. Now, this is her father, that's Alfred Bunting. He was the owner of North Nurseries. This is their dog, he was called Spot. There's one of the trams that used to go regularly past their home and here's North Station Road leading up to North Station. There's the Bunting family home just here. And this um, picture is nowadays, there's a little mini roundabout there where you've got Wicks, the do-it-yourself um, centre. But that's where it was. So the trams, as I said earlier, every five minutes there'd be a tram going past. Now Winnie told me this lovely little story about her mother. She said, my mother um, used to go shopping into town two or three times a week on the tram and she always took Spot with her. She said Spot was a, a favourite of my mother and she'd always take him out. So mother and Spot would come out the door and they would stand on the path here and when the tram come it would stop and they'd get on. Now mother used to go downstairs but dogs were not allowed downstairs so Spot used to run up the staircase and sit upstairs. You still had to pay for the animals but they, they, a small affair. Anyway, when the tram got to the top of North Hill, she said mother would get off, Spot would come running down the stairs, and then they would cross over the road and go to the well-known grocery shop at the top of North Hill, which was called Oliver and Parker. She said mother would go and give in her order, whereas Spock, um, Spot would make his way to the bacon counter. And no doubt, you know, they used to throw him a bacon bone. And when mother had finished shopping, the mother and Spot would come out the shop and they would wait at the nearby tram stop and get a ride back home again. And she says this became so popular that all the tram drivers and conductors knew Spot um, and it was a regular thing. She said, but on one occasion, Spot must have been feeling a little bit peckish and he decided he was going to go to town and get his bone. But of course, it wasn't shopping day. But anyway, apparently he walked out and sat on the pavement. When the tram came along, obviously they saw Spot, <laughs> the tram driver stopped. Now, obviously not going to get any fare on this occasion, but Spot would run upstairs and sit up top. When the tram got to the top of North Hill, Spot would run off, go straight across the road into this shop, straight to the bacon counter, get his bone. And when he came out, he didn't walk home. He would sit and wait for the tram and go back. And she says this went on for years um, and he was a real character and all the tram people knew about Spot. And that's a, a lovely story that you, you wouldn't normally find without someone telling you um, in an interview or something. The trams in Colchester only lasted for about 25 years. So from 1904, the final tram stopped in 1929. And many of the old trams were, I mean, they converted to motor buses, of course, because they would go much further. Um, and there was lots of competition from other motor buses coming in out of Colchester. But anyway, the old trams were sold off for a few pounds each. Some were bought up and used as garden sheds, as you can see in the picture on the left at Great Hawksley. Um, others were sold off as building site huts and things like this. This one at Thorrington was in someone's garden, but apparently um, that was sadly set on light, set on fire in the 1960s. Um, this one here became a little tea room at the Langenhoe Lion converted tram which is quite a novel little idea um, and here we're going to move on now to some of the shops if you like 
Now, we spoke at the very beginning that some of these ladies wore these long skirts, and we can see that here, look, in this picture here. And they're looking in a shop window here, which was a, a famous shop in the town, one I've mentioned earlier, this was Looms, Harry Looms Drapery Shop. And here it is, and this is now, although it's been rebuilt a bit, this is the McDonald's restaurant building. But anyway, Looms sold everything. Everything, material, drapery, buttons, all, all sorts of things you could think of. Now, like many Edwardian firms of the time, and even in later periods, they had a special way of marking up the goods that they sold. In other words, they would, everything they sold would typically end in so many three farthings. In later years, it might be halfpennies, but so many three farthings. So, for example, a man couldn't buy a suit for three pounds. It would be two pounds, 19, 11 pence, three farthings. Or, say, a lady's skirt wouldn't be 10 shillings. It would be nine, 11 pence, three farthings. And um, so when you went to buy something, let's just say it was... Um, a, a pound no say it was 19 and 11 pence three farthings most people wouldn't have that exact money so you hand over a pound so you've got a farthing change so you stand there you know with your hand out maybe waiting for your change but you never ever got your farthing change this wasn't just in Colchester this was general you never you'd, you'd stand there all day they would never give you your change and I often used to wonder how much money they must have made for all these farthings but of course, they did put something in your hand. So you're waiting for your change, you hold your hand out, and rather than putting a farthing in your hand, they often used to put a little strip of pins in your hand, such as this. This is a, a genuine strip that my, my late mother-in-law gave me, that um, they would give you a little strip of pins, or sometimes maybe a little strip of buttons, or something like that. And if you've ever wondered why so many people have got tins and tins, or they used to have uh, pins in their house and stored away and buttons, this may have been one of the reasons. They, they also had one of these lamps and compressed air machines in here, which many stores had, where they would put your money into a little brass container, pull a lever, and it would shoot up um, to the cash office and, and back again. But yeah, I mean, I can remember those... Um, those tubes, those lamp com lamps and compressed air machines in the co-op, I think they had one of them back in the 50s or, or maybe a bit later. But this is what it's like now, look, this is um, what it was like then and, and that's the building, slightly shortened in height, but that's the building that we've, we've got today. Another shop um, from the Edwardian period is this one. This is on the corner of, this is High Street and Head Street. And this is Ernest Barrett again. This is the mayor, remember the mayor? Well, he was also a chemist, and this was one of the, the most important pharmacies in Colchester, Ernest Barrett. And um, some of you may remember Boots the Chemist, you know, in the 60s occupying, in the 70s occupying this premises. And when it was Boots, of course, they also had an upstairs lending library. You could actually borrow books from there. But Barrett's, um, apart from selling, you know, medical prescriptions, that they also did a, a roaring trade in fancy goods, toys, um, picture postcards, um, but they also sold teeth. You could go in there and buy a single tooth for two and sixpence, or you could buy a whole set for a guinea. And they even advertised it in the standard look. This is Barrett's down the bottom here. Teeth, complete set one guinea, upper or lower single teeth, two and six. And they guaranteed them for five years. And apparently on a Saturday look every week, they would have a dentist from London who would come round and do some of the dental work for them. I always imagine, you know, this is um, like when you go into a jeweler's shop and you, you want to see a tray of rings and they'll bring a certain tray. Or, oh, these rings are all certain type. You can imagine going into this shop and having all these different teeth laid out on display. Um, from all different sources, who knows where, um, and saying, well, can I look at those ones? Oh, yes, th th these are from so-and-so. Um, it makes the mind boggle, really, doesn't it? Another thing that um, some of you may remember your parents telling you this, uh, certainly I know my parents and my mother-in-law told me this, that many people in the past used to have all their teeth taken out and false teeth put in. There's nothing wrong with their teeth. In fact, many people you, used to be on a 21st birthday present, will get you a set of false teeth. 
I don't know if this resonates with anyone, but a lot of people in the past, you know, just because their teeth didn't look perfect, a bit more wonky maybe, they would have them all taken out and wear false teeth. Lots of people from this period had false teeth, and you, you may remember that. And finally, before I move on, I remember giving this talk several years ago now, and an elderly gentleman at the end in the audience, I think he came from Leytonstone or some Walthamstow, maybe somewhere in Essex, and he said that really brought some memories back to me about that because he said my father used to run a chemist shop and he said i can always remember sitting up in our private rooms and hearing people hollering out and shouting out in pain in the dentist chair and i thought my goodness i hadn't realized i thought this was maybe a one-off and he says no i think most chemists in the early period like the early 20th century they also had a dentist chair in there as well this is just um, around the corner in Head Street. So this is um, this is E M P Baker's shop. This was a, a sort of high fashion, high fashion ladies shop. And in the 1960s, along with Heesman's, which was a jeweller, and Williams the ironmonger, and Griffiths the house furniture, they all went together to form what we know, or what we used to know as Williams and Griffiths department store. This tram here, look, tram car number ten. See tram car number 10? Well, remember the picture we saw in the garden at Great Hawksley? Well, that is that very same car. And that's how it ended up. It's actually currently still around and it's actually very slowly being restored. Um, inside the shop, this is a picture inside A&P Baker's shop at the time. And I can remember in later years when this became Harper's Sports Shop, they still had these classical columns in there. But you can see what's on sale. These, these are feather bowers, look, that the, the ladies are going to be wearing around their shoulders. And I often say to people, what are these things here? Of course, they are chairs for people to sit on. You know, in, in those days, many of the shops in Colchester, you know, the ones that are not multinationals, are, the owners would live on the premises. Many of the staff lived on the premises. And when you went in, they'd sit you down. They would run around getting your stuff for you um, rather than you have to um, get your order yourself. I remember when I was growing up in the 50s, even at the co-op, my mother would go in there and sit down, hand over her list, and whoever was serving her would run around the shop getting everything for her. But that, that's the different generation. That's, that's what it was like, of course. So this is Williams. Now, this was... Um, this was a typical Victorian ironmonger shop. It stood on the site of where the Phoenix stop is, shop is now in the high street. So that was the ironmonger. This was Griffin's. Now this picture, this is when they were in Head Street, where Woolworths used to be, and where currently H&M building is. So that was Griffin. And I said they went in with Heesman's and E.M.P. Baker to form Williams and Griffin's. Um, when you, in the 1930s, when you could have purchased or built a house between three and four hundred pounds, you could have furnished the, almost the entire building for 70 or 80 pounds in Griffin's. I've got the receipts at home here. That's everything. Bedroom furniture, lounge suites, the whole lot for about 70 or 80 pounds. Just shows you how times have progressed. But they all went together to form what originally was Williams and Griffin's, this shop here. But in the last few years, of course, they have now transferred it or rebuilt it and it's now um, one of the Fenwick stores. I just thought I'd show you this one. This is down the other end of the high street. Another lovely typical Edwardian shop. Um, 1908 you can see there. This is Joslyn's Ironmongery shop and it was huge. They own this building over here as well. Over here uh, right around the block. You can see in the street they've got um, players, agriculture machinery, players and what have you. They sold motorcycles, they were agricultural engineers, electric light engineers, and typical ironmongers. And they, they were still around until the late, late 1950s. Some of you may just remember Joslyn's on this corner. Another shop um, which was very popular in the period, Bateman and Winkle, tailors and outfitters. Many of the girls who worked in the clothing factories in Colchester, they, they had to buy their own cotton and needles and scissors and things like this. And they would often come here, I'm told, to Bateman and Winkle. I can remember in the 1960s, 
some of you may, this, this part of the shop here was a little tobacconist shop called Hazel's. Um, and let's say that, that, that then changed, but I, I'm sure you, remember, you, you can see what the shop used to be because it, it developed into this look, into Jack's. So Jack's was a very popular shop where you could buy cheap goods of all different descriptions, which has sadly in the last few years passed away and it's, it's, it's moved on again. I quite like this image because this is a, a taken a few years back when they used to hang all the stuff outside the shop. But up here, look, you've got wheelbarrows, um, dustbins hanging just above where people are walking. You know, and a few years ago when the health and safety brigade took over, you know, this became a foreseeable risk <laughs> that could actually fall and hurt somebody. So stricter health and safety rules came into place. And in later years, they never used to hang these heavy goods. They would always still hang coats and things like this, parkers and what have you. They used to put them up with a big pole look. You can see the chap here, but they, they stopped putting the, the heavy equipment up. Now, I, 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 before we conclude, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the events that took place in the Edwardian period, because the Edwardians were very much into fun and celebrating things. And um, the great Colchester pageant, which took place in 1909, was even, it's the largest event that's ever taken place in Castle Park during its history. And it was a massive historical drama. And, and the putting on of pageants was, was an Edwardian thing. They did one in Warwick, they did one in Dover. And somebody from Colchester went to see the one at one of these places and they came back and said, one of the councillors, they said, we've got to have one in Colchester. Well, the people who ran Colchester in those days were, you know, champions of industry. You know, the Wilson marriages, the James Paxmans of this world, and they got things done. There was nothing put on the back burner. They, we're going to have a tram system. We'll get on with it. We have a new town hall. Get it done. Paget, yes, we'll have one. That was the mentality, I think. So anyway, it took two years to plan and organise this great pageant. Over 3,000 people took part. And they were all amateurs. They were school children, mums and dads, shop owners. They all learnt their lines. They, they made their costumes. They did practices. And then for a whole week between the 21st and the 26th of June 1909, the Lower Castle Park became the pageant ground. It's interesting when I, when, you know, I would probably have described that Lower Castle Park as the tattoo ground because that's where the tattoos used to be. Nowadays, it's the concert ground, perhaps. But Edwardian people always called it the pageant ground. And they put on this pageant for about a week, and people came from all over the country to see it. And it was a, although it was a miserable week weather-wise, it was a resounding success. And this is where I just want to bring Winnie back, Winnie Bunting. So there she is um, when I interviewed her. This is her when she was a schoolgirl, aged 11 years old. And she says, I was in the pageant. And she was quite fortunate really, because she was one of the youngest people to be in the pageant. You had to be at least 11. And she was 11. She was born in 1898. And she was telling me that she, she went to Ensley School. And she says, all the girls at Ensley School, plus another couple of schools, girls, we all took part in something called the rose dance. And here's a picture of her in her rose dance um, outfit. And she told me that she says she was one of the very youngest girls. So she was right in the very front row. And she says, I wore the very palest of pink frocks. And I had to dance with a silk ribbon. And she says, the girls behind us in the next row back were a bit older than us, a bit taller. And they all had a slightly deeper pink frock. And behind them, deeper and deeper, until you get to the very back row, they were almost in scarlet. Now, although this was in black and white, you're looking at, the way she was describing it, I could imagine the colour. And this would have been a, a thrilling spectacle. On the right hand side is the pageant master himself, Louis Napoleon Parker, with his big megaphone, barking out instructions during rehearsals. He had been responsible for putting on two or three other pageants around the country at the time. And when Colchester Borough Council secured his, um, you know, to come and do it for Colchester, they kind of knew it was going to be successful. So he was the pageant master. 
This is part of the final tableau at the end of the performance each day. All three to three and a half thousand performers would line up if you like to take their salute from those in, in the grandstand and all those others watching. One other big event we can't ignore um, in the Edwardian period in Colchester was the arrival of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show to Colchester. Everybody's heard, of course, of Buffalo Bill, uh, a massive Wild West show. He'd, 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 he'd been over to England in the late Victorian period, but in 1903, he came, he brought his show over the Atlantic again uh, to England for another grand tour. Now, the, they, they first of all put up a very short season, two or three weeks at Olympia, before traveling around the country, stopping off at various time periods at all the cities and what have you. And then he, on, on, February, on September the 4th, 1903, very early in the morning, when most people in Colchester are probably still going to be fast asleep in bed, three large show trains rolled into North Station. And when I say three large trains, I, I, I usually ask people, how many carriages do you think a large train would pull? 12? 15? 20? Each of these three show trains pulled 50 carriages each. And they unloaded from these carriages at least 500 horses, 800 personnel and these personnel included plains cowboys sioux indians or first nation indians russian cossacks mexican vasqueros and so on um british cavalry officers and all the equipment and they made their way from north station up to reed hall reed hall is up where lair road is where the football ground used to be the, the, the military houses up there now and they went to Reed Hall and by 12 midday they had erected an undercover seating grandstand to seat 10,000 people undercover. They did that by dinner time. They put on a big show in the afternoon and another big show in the evening and by midnight the entire thing had been dismantled and they were loading it all again onto North Station ready to go to the next venue. It really was a major operation. And we're lucky to have found this um, photograph of what looks like a, um, a barber shop, maybe a news agent combined, and they've got one of the show posters. You can see it enlarged here in the window. Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, um, September the 4th. I mean, this, this was actually packed. All the school children took an afternoon off school. The factory girls, the shop girls, the town camp, everybody wanted to go and see Buffalo Bill. I mean, his visit was more important really than, you know, than a royal visit at the time. So anyway, the, the show went on in the afternoon. It lasted two or three hours. They did another big show in the evening. And apparently there was terrible thunderstorms and lightning and rain. But that didn't really put people, people still enjoyed it. They used their own generators to produce their own electricity for that, apparently. But there's a, the grandstand, not a great photograph, but you can see this grandstand would seat 10,000 people. Apparently in the evening performance, when there was a thunderstorm and it rained, those in the front seats who had to pay more got drenched because the water was falling off the top of the canvas, apparently on top of them. And there's Buffalo Bill and all the entourage in that picture. And just by comparison, look, there's Colts United's football stadium. That also seats 10,000 pounds, but... You know, that took about a year or so to complete. This is an example of one of many school logbooks. This is um, the Culver Street Wesleyan School. Look, September the 4th, we're going to read these lines, look. It says, owing to such a large number going to see Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, we had most reluctantly to give a holiday this afternoon. No one's going to be there. It would, it's not worth, they had to close the school because of that. Here we've got the typical program on the left. Um, there was all sorts of historical enact, enactments. One down the bottom here you can see the attack on a settler's cabin. Apparently, here it is, um, to the side of the arena there would be this settler's cabin, be on wheels, and at the right given moment that would be wheeled into the middle of the arena the, the the settler here he would go off do some hunting leaving his wife here and then he he comes back and he's he's got some meat and everything and then what happens he's attacked by these indians 
um, surrounding it and they're going round and round in circles. And of course, who comes to the rescue? Yeah, Buffalo Bill. He only rides into the arena with all the cowboys on his white horse and saves the day. And, um, you know, that, that I mean, the, the crowd loved that thing. Every, everybody, I think, remembers Miss Annie Oakley. She was a sharpshooter, of course. She came, she joined Buffalo Bill Circus um, for many years. And um, apparently, one of her party tricks was she could shoot a playing card held on edge from 30 paces. And she also had a special trick where she would sh put the rifle over her shoulder and shoot at a target behind her. And she would do that by using a mirror look as depicted here. They also had horse races, acrobats, shooting contests. Here we've got Buffalo Bill. On the left, we've got Russian Cossacks. These are Sioux Indians. Now these are Oglala Sioux and Hunkapapa Sioux from South Dakota. These are the same First Nation um, tribesmen, if you like, that fought General Custer at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. In the bottom picture, again, Sioux tribesmen have taken over this tram in Manchester. And if you'd like to learn more about Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, I can thoroughly recommend Alan Gallup's book on the whole event, all the trips. I'm going to finish here. This is my last slide. And it's a, another story I'd like to tell you that was told to me by this lady on the right, Nellie Lismore. Now, Nellie Lismore was, used to be, was Nellie Mabson, Mabson, and she was born down the Hive in 1889. And I interviewed Nellie when she was 100, so that would have been 1989. And on the left, we can see a couple of very well-known Colchester characters, Emma and Grimes. Marmalade Emma and Teddy Grimes. They were a popular pair of characters, tramps, who used to tramp around the local highways and byways, late Victorian Ed Edwardian period. They had nowhere to live. They would sleep in the hedgerows, maybe in an old shed somewhere or something like that. Um, and everybody around town would have known them. Teddy Grimes on the left here came from a fairly respectable family. His father was Samuel Grimes, who was a local builder in Northgate Street. His father was Joseph, his uncle rather, was Joseph Grimes, who was a town councillor. And Teddy and his sister Annie had both been given a private education. And he started off as an apprentice draftsman at Paxman's. Not a bad start in life, really, someone born in the 1860s. Emma um, had a slightly different background. She came from a family called Taylor at Great Hawksley, but she was often in trouble she was in, pr in a prison apparently on one occasion she she clipped a policeman around the face and got a month's hard labor on another occasion she was um refusing to pick oakum in the workhouse and i i, I did read something else um in vineyard street where you go up to the vineyard street car park as you go in on the left hand side there used to be a fish and chip shop it's now a chinese restaurant that used to be the british lion pub and in the 1880s, in the census, um, all of Vineyard Street was lodging houses, by the way. And um, they used to, people used to have lodgings in this pub as well. And one of the people living there was um, Emma Taylor. She was 21 years old at the time. And um, under the section where it says what your occupation is, she'd written down prostitute. I mean, she could have said anything. She could have said dressmaker. She could have left it blank. But that was Emma being forthright. But anyway, they were inseparable. They lived as man and wife, although they, they weren't married. Well, they were married, but not to each other. They were married to other people, but they lived together. And anyway, when I spoke to Nellie, she was one of the last people to have seen Emma alive. I'm just going to finish up with, with her story. Before I do that, I must just say that Emma, and Nellie rather, used to have a business in the arcade, the old arcade near Long Wire Street. And it was a haberdasher's shop. It was called Lizamore and Clark. And she, uh, um, she married her husband, Frank Lizamore, sometime before the First World War. And they went to live, she moved from the Hive, they got a house in Roman Road. Now when war came along, First World War, Frank was called up 
Nellie didn't want to be on her own as a young housewife, so she went back to live with her mother down the hive. And it was on one of these evenings when she was walking from Long Wire Street, going to go down the hive, that she saw Emma. And this is what she said. She says, I was walking down Long Wire Street and I turned left at the bottom into Short Wire Street and then I saw them. She said, Grimes was standing by the side of the road and Emma was heaped on, a, on the floor in a shop doorway. And she says, I went over to them to ask how Emma was. And she says, Emma looked as yellow as a guinea. And Grimes said to me, and I said to Grimes, where are you going to sleep tonight? And apparently he said to me, he said to her, well, if, if we had a shilling, we'd sleep in the lodging house. And he's talking about the common lodging houses in, in Vineyard Street. So Nellie, remembering this with clarity, said, I opened my purse, took out a shilling and gave it to him. And then she says, Grimes said to me, Emma wants butter. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I haven't got any butter. And with that, I continued down the road and crossed over where Queen Street and St Butter Street is. She says, as I was crossing over the road, a policeman on the other side called out to me. He said, oi, you've just given our friend some money, haven't you? Because it was against the law to support vagrants at that time. And she says, yes. And he said, well, look where they're going. And she says, I turned round and both of them went down, now on their feet and they were shuffling into the tobacconist shop. Probably going to spend some of the five, um, their shilling on some snuff or something, perhaps. But then Nellie says, I, I went across Priory Street and on the corner of Priory Street, there used to be a tea shop, a cake shop called Washers. She said, I went into Washers and I said to the lady that Emma's not well and Grimes says she wants some butter. She said, the lady said to me, well, I'm very sorry, dear. I can't let you have some pieces of butter, but I can let you have some bread and butter that's been left over from the teas. So she says, I took this plate of bread and butter, went and found Grimes and gave it to him. And then I went home. She said, the next morning when I was coming to work, I saw Grimes standing by the side of the road and he had a black armband on. And he said to me, Emma died last night and she didn't want bread and butter. Now, that was the end of Nellie's story and she wanted to talk about something else. And I was thinking, well, what, what happened next? But Nellie wasn't going to talk anymore about that. So I had to do a bit of research. I knew this had to have been during the First World War when Nellie was back living home with her mother. And I eventually found a record of um, Emma's death in the standard. And apparently she died in 1917. Um, the cause of death having, so once I knew I went and got a death certificate, cost me about £5.50 at the time. And um, she was 58 years old. Um, Bronical problems was the cause of death. The man who registered the death was Teddy Grimes here, but he had registered her as Mrs. Grimes, although they weren't actually married. But the, the place of death was the common lodging house in Vineyard Street. And I think that's quite nice because the, the last good act that Nellie did by giving them this money, at least poor old Emma had a bed to lay on um, during her very last days. Since I've, um, you know, given this talk on numerous occasions, I, I remember a couple of people have come up and added comments. One was a, an, an ex-GP and uh, he said the very fact that she was described as being as yellow as a guinea might also suggest some kind of, um, you know, perhaps medical problem. But um, anyway, Grimes left on his own. He didn't last very long on his own outside and he ended up being taken into the workhouse in Colchester, where I believe he died about 1924. But I'm going to finish here. I hope that's been of some interest to you. And can I just say thanks for listening in and watching the video.